Welcome everyone. Uh, as Frank mentioned, uh, I'm a principal data scientist, which means I take some numbers together and I add them, but I sometimes multiply them together. And uh, if any of you are sort of uncomfortable with, with that, I'm also a professor at uh, London School. For those of you who are actually interested in what I really do, um, there's a URL that you can click on, uh, and I also have a PhD internship in epidemiology this summer. Uh, so this work was predominantly done when I was a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute on uh, Data Science and AI, more buzzwords for you. Um, and so um, for reasons that become apparent, uh, I'd like to thank the people that are on the slide who helped with uh, getting this project off the ground. And then it was a small project in terms of money, but we had uh, multiple funders uh, including Microsoft, uh, Julia Computing, and uh, uh, also like to thank Mark Lipsitch from uh, Harvard as well, who really helped out. So the overall tenet is that, as we've seen, particularly with novel coronavirus, that mathematical models of infectious disease transmission are widely used um, to get parameter estimates, to guide policy, and so on. And over the past decades, those models have gone from quite simple ones to increasingly complex ones where we rely upon simulation, uh, stochastic models rather than deterministic ones. And because of that, it becomes harder to tell whether models are correct or not. And that's particularly important if we're actually going to base our decision making on them. Now, how can a model actually be correct? Uh, well, there are many criteria of truth. One is a very simple one, that's correspondence that is that the model does what I say it does. So that I have a paper and I describe the model and actually there aren't any typos in it and I've given all of the initial conditions, et cetera. Um, perhaps all too often we have this idea of authority as truth. You know, I'm an uh, important mathematical modeler and I have a model and you should trust me because I am an authority. Um, uh, then, on the other hand, you know, perhaps on the more junior sort of level, uh, pragmatic, which, which I certainly did when I was a graduate student. If it works, it must be true. Um, but I'll focus really on the idea that there should be a, a consensus of models. And that is not always an appropriate measure of truth for things like uh, there being a flat earth. But when there is some sort of innate truth, there's some sort of process that we're trying to get at, whether it's a mathematical model that describes something or actually the real world phenomenon, then there is some sort of innate truth that we should be trying to target. Now, getting to a consensus, we can think of in a couple of levels. One is that we try to get exactly the same results as somebody else's model, the same inputs, the same outputs. But at the very least, we should have a model that should be able to be reproduced. You should be able to give a model to somebody, and perhaps they use a slightly different set of assumptions, perhaps they use a different computer language, but more or less, they can reproduce the, the essence of the results. So the take-home messages for the next 20 minutes are that many published studies are very hard to reproduce. I'll present several examples. Um, I won't mention names, they've been changed to protect the innocent. Um, and that's because most of the time, people aren't trying to hide or obscure their research. It's just that there isn't really a, a sort of structure that can follow um, in order to make their work reproducible. And I like to argue that both replication, getting exactly the same result, as well as reproducing results are important. And we should try to engage a diverse range of groups and approaches and ideas to try to make that consensus approach more robust. And um, finally, I'll, I'll talk about a platform that we've developed to try to make that um, goal uh, easier. So here's one study from the early 90s. And this is a, a model on chaotic dynamics in measles. The idea being that you have an SEAR model where you have some seasonal forcing of the infectivity parameter. And as you ramp up the seasonal forcing parameter, 
you go from um, these uh, biennial epidemics alternating between small ones and large ones and, and ultimately getting to what look like chaotic dynamics. This was very much sort of in vogue in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And so because I think it's an interesting model, um, I tried to reproduce it. There are a number of barriers to doing that. One is that there are certain missing details from the paper. They don't say what the initial conditions were in the model. They don't say what the solver was used or the time step or because those results uh, after the transient has gone away, what length of transient was used. So I corresponded with the first author. He uh, confessed that the original code was long gone. Uh, this is a sort of recurring theme <laughs> that you'll see. And he probably used this fifth order uh, Ranjikata code from numerical recipes in C because he was using a lot of that at the time. Um, so uh, I didn't have a copy of numerical recipes lying around. Um, so I tried to use some more modern software to do more or less the same thing. I used a package called a differential equations.jl, which is a, a very modern solver package. It's got many, many solvers for both ODEs, SDEs, etc. And I, I put in what I believed to be the, the right tableau for the Runge-Cut solver, as well as um, back in those days, we had 32-bit computers, not 64-bit, and so the precision of the numbers that go into the model was lower. Um, but I couldn't get the same results. Uh, but what I could test is that if I change the number to 32 to 64-bit precision or 128-bit, I got different results. And then if I just change the solver that's better suited to those stiff problems where the rates in the model change by orders of magnitude, I could get different results. So perhaps in this case, it's not surprising that I can't get exactly the same results because things are very sensitive to the technical details. When you say you get different results, what do you mean? Because in chaotic dynamics, it's not too strange. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. So um, I, couldn't, I couldn't get the, um, the bifurcations at the right points. So, um, and then in many cases, the, uh, the solver just got really upset with me. Um, uh, so... Hmm? Yeah, it's a bifurcation diagram. So there weren't details either in terms of whether the bifurcation diagram was really using some sort of continuation approach or whether it was just sort of taking uh, minimum and maximum or, or some sampling of points along the trajectory. So that, that wasn't clear either. So both in terms of getting these things as well as trying to get these things, it, it just wasn't clear. But, but this is a, a, a model that was proposed you know, 30 years ago, so, um, so perhaps, you know, if we get a little bit more modern, we should have a, a better chance, with more modern computers, etc. cetera. Um, so this is a, a model of a, a subcritical process where we're trying to look at a disease that is spilling over from some reservoir. And White and Pagano in 2008 developed a, a method for inferring R0 and the serial interval using case onset data, which is based upon a branching process. Um, and in the study I'll talk about, this is extended to consider um, introductions from outside, so this spillover from a, a zoonotic reservoir, allowing that rate to change in a sort of piecewise fashion over time, and then also having the infections within the department, it, it, within the population. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea here is that if you've got some zoonotic spillover, you'd like to know how many times it, it crossed the species barrier. And the data that we used were these cases of H7N9 influenza in three different um, cities in China. And you see in, in all cases, the epidemic dies out. But because it's um, subcritical, you can actually, at least under some parameter regimes, identify those different parameters. So um, the original code was lost. <laughs> Um, I think when somebody just moved on to a different career, um, they had a sort of mixture of sort of frequentist and Bayesian approaches, and it was kind of hard to separate where they used what. Uh, for the Bayesian side of things, the, the priors and the algorithm for allowing the spillover rate to change over time weren't given, and that's a non-trivial problem. 
Um, the raw data, the line lists, were not included, uh, although you could possibly sort of read them off from the graphs. And, um, but the clarifications were provided by the first author on those points, but I still couldn't replicate the model. So in all of this, this could be just that I'm really bad at replicating models, okay, so bear that in mind. Um, so I took a different approach. I had some code lying around from uh, the POMP library in R, which uh, Ed's already mentioned. I'm not using any of these fancy samplers, just a very, very uh, simple immigration birth death process uh, that was fit using uh, particle MCMC. And we have jumps from the reservoir into our population at rate iota. And then we have just a simple sort of birth death process with the birth rates less than the death rate. And I configured it so that I tried to infer the number of jumps. And for one, uh, these are the 95% uh, credible intervals. These are um, sort of the distribution that I get for number of jumps. And I'm getting virtually the same number of jumps that the original paper did for Jiangsu, uh, not too far off at Shanghai, and then quite different results from Zhejiang. But we're not talking about orders of magnitude difference. Remembering as well that the original model was more complicated and had those step functions in the spillover rate. So I, I couldn't quite get exactly the same results, but perhaps that's not surprising. But the idea that there's more than one spillover event driving these epidemics is reasonable in this case. Um, and so sort of in this case, the, I, I argue that we sort of lend support to the fact that they got their model correct in that they, um, their model does what they say it does, even though we can't actually prove that. Last of all, um, this seems to be in vogue, I'll talk about some inference on the novel coronavirus outbreak. There were a number of studies that I looked at to try to see how reproducible they were. And this is uh, one study where um, what they tried to do was to take a branching process and say how big R0 would have to be in order to give them around 4,000 cases on the 18th of January. This is something that the, the group had done previously, and then they tried to look at, you know, based upon those inferences, what R0 would have to be. And whilst they didn't say it's a Bellman-Harris branching process, it's kind of what it is, and um, there are some barriers to try to reproduce those results. Firstly, they didn't say, um, so the Bellman-Harris branching process, you could have some arbitrary distribution of the generation times, and um, they didn't give the standard deviation of that. Um, but they did provide a reference uh, to SARS, so most people just picked up the SARS generation time and plugged it into their models. So I did that, um, but I still couldn't reproduce their results based upon this statement that they started with 40 initial infectives. So one of the authors finally clarified what the problem was, and that is that rather than having 40 people at time zero, they had 40 people introduced spread out over a month. So they're assuming that the spillover was like a constant process uh, spread out over a long period of time rather than having lots of initial cases. And that gives you very, very different results. So the, these are my graphs. This is my original attempt where I started off with 40 people on December the 2nd, and by the 18th I'm having over 15,000 individuals, whereas if I do what I think they've done in terms of spreading out the infectives, the results are not exact, but they're, they're broadly comparable. So, so this is assuming an R naught of around two and a half. Overall, only five out of 11 studies that, um, that I looked at for um, trying to infer or, or sort of model R0 provided any code. One of those used parallel computing, which means you have to sort of rework the code to try and get it to run locally. Um, another one used commercial data on airline flights that potentially you could buy, but you would have to have some way to sort of say that those models are the same. And um, the remainder didn't provide enough information in the paper for you to be able to reproduce them. Uh, that being said, at least the R0 estimates were all sort of fairly consistent between two or three, which, as many of us know, unless you're talking about polio or measles, is essentially R0 for everything. Um, 
I'm happy to, for people to disagree on that. Um, so why should people share code rather than just publish? As I've already stated, people move on and code is lost. There's a lack of details in the written description of the models. And we can't just rely upon oral tradition for reproducibility. Um, if you have code out there, you can build upon others' work and get citations, um, which you know is the, the currency of our trade, unfortunately. It may also help to improve communication within a group. So if you can pass code around, someone can look at the fine details and, and bring them up for discussion rather than just rely upon oral communication. Um, the answers may be implementation specific. So if you use MATLAB or Python or R or something. Um, and then the software itself changes over time. So I used to use this Pascal package called Solver from Nisbet and Gurney. And um, I actually, uh, Otto Bjornstad sent me an old version of that. I didn't get a chance to sort of play around with it much, but you know, things can be lost. And uh, so being more open about the research can only really help in reproducibility. So why don't people include their code? At least early on, it was because the ability to share materials um, wasn't available or it cost money. You had to pay a journal to host supplementary information. Sometimes there's a failure to see the need to do that. If you've just used your simulations to back up your maths, then the sort of simulations are thrown away as being some poor approximation of the truth, which is what you've got in the manuscript. Sometimes regarded as pointless. If somebody can't um, reproduce the results elsewhere because if the data aren't public, so why even make the code public if you can't do that? Uh, it's time consuming. People feel the need to be able to document code. There's the fear of being scooped if you have some large agent-based model that you've worked on tirelessly with grant money. There's a fear that somebody might come along with that and do the next big thing that you're going to do with that. And then uh, probably the most common is that people are just embarrassed at their code. <laughs> that uh, they don't want, you know, they have these beautiful maths and a lovely story, and then you see this sort of picture of Dorian Gray code behind the paper. Um, so what about teaching resources? Um, so published research is generally not open, uh, but teaching material on its very basis should be better. But, but is it? So here's a textbook that many of you I'm sure know from Keeling and Rohani. It has a good selection of conceptual models. They're mostly in C, C++, and Fortran, which is great if you like to code in those things. And then some uh, people have come along and um, translated those models into Python. There's other cases where people have converted it into R. And so that's not, that's not bad. There's another textbook by Emilia Vinicky uh, and Richard White which accompanies the London School of Infectious Disease course. It focuses on introductory models, and it has these models in Microsoft Excel and Berkeley Madonna. So Excel's commercial, but basically everyone has it. Uh, Berkeley Madonna is quite expensive, but it allows you sort of, it's quite a fast solver, it's quite easy to use. There's a, another textbook by uh, Maya Marcheva that's actually quite good in terms of the, the content. But essentially, there are only a handful of examples of actually running the models that you use to make the diagrams. And these, if you look at the acknowledgments, were done by this person's student, for which they're very grateful. But it's not a um, sort of complete set of examples. It would be remiss of me not to uh, mention uh, Chris Filler and Simon. Uh, it's a very good book. I mean, it, it's sort of a narrower domain than these other books. It focuses on network models. But, um, but Joel spent, I assume, a lot of time writing his uh, epidemics on networks model. But yeah, that's really. <laughs> I'm sorry to remind you then. So, so if you do play around with these things, please use Joel's library and cite him. So, uh, um, it's not always a sort of linear improvement over time. So there's this uh, model, there's this book here, which comes out of a graduate level modeling course, but it only has a single example of code for parameter estimation. So assuming, assuming that there should be all of the teaching materials that were made for the course, but those aren't available via the book. 
And then uh, lastly, there's a, a book by Otto Bjornstad that I think is very good. That's just my opinion. Other books are available. Um, and the entire book, however, is written as a series of R notebooks. And you can get the code freely uh, on the web. And then there are also reusable functions that you can use. But that's really if you, if you like using R for these sorts of things. There are also a number of excellent courses for doing modeling. Um, there are sort of several in the UK alone. The material is often closed. These charge money for the, um, for the course. And for, I think, fairly obvious reasons, use a single computer language for the practicals, just because that makes the learning easier. So teaching resources often include code, although that's variable. Courses and textbooks are limited in their use of examples, however. Um, and what you'd really like is to have not only the introductory models, but also the state of the art that we have in publications. But, uh, and if you have your models, much as you may love MATLAB, if you have it in a commercial package, then it isn't really open. You know, not everyone can afford the sort of money the, I'll skip that, sort of money that you might need. So MATLAB is over 200 pounds a year, Mathematica around 1,000 pounds a year, Berkeley Madonna's over 200 pounds. And if you want somebody to reproduce your results, they, they just want to take a look at what you've done, they're not going to do this for a one-off um, study. Um, so what we tried to do was try and take a collection of open source tools and use that as a platform for reproducible research. So the concept that I'm hinging this around is a, a set of principles that were originally developed in the context of data called the FAIR principles, that you should be able to find things, you should be able to access them, they should be interoperable with different um, you know, say software packages, and they should be reusable. And there are a number of cases in the data world and other parts of modeling where that's the case. So genomics has kind of led the way for doing that. There are the um, multiple databases like NCBI, EBI, uh, DDBJ, uh, GISAID, which has hosted not only flu data, but more recently the coronavirus genomic data. There's a, a website hosted by Andrew Rambo that uh, provides sort of uh, analyses and so on, reports of data before it's even been published. Um, my colleague Thibaut Jombard and I um, set up a repository of data for outbreaks, just sort of case data over time, but that way you can find and access uh, both simulated and real data. And um, I've also done this sort of work for molecular epidemiology, trying to collate together all the different tools that you could use to work out who infected whom. So the, I'll just, for the last five minutes, I'll just say what we've been trying to do to fix this issue of reproducibility. And what I would like to do is to be able to illustrate different diseases, how you might model them, different tricks that we, over the years, have uh, learned, like the Selka construction, et cetera, having things that are open source and free so that everyone can use them, implemented in different languages so that you can use your favorite one and you have an example that's in your favorite language, and can be run via a web browser so you don't have to install anything and conform to these FAIR principles. So the, the initiative is called EPA Recipes, and it's a word that sort of captures both this overall initiative, a platform on which to run models, uh, an online interactive cookbook that has a bunch of these models, a community of researchers, that would be great if you also joined, to uh, contribute to this resource, and then the occasional sort of hackathon to try to increase the catalog of models that we have. So the platform, I won't bore you with the engineering details, but uh, it took me quite a long time to put all together. It's more or less living in the cloud, and, um, but all of the details are sort of hidden from the user. Uh, you just have to worry about the, the modeling side of things. And it's portable, it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. You can set up something uh, locally if you want to, or you can just use it on the web just with pointing at a URL. So far, I'm trying to capture as many tools as I can so that there are multiple languages, both interpreted and compiled. There are computer algebra systems that are free, 
can't include Mathematica for that reason, and various other tools that people have used for plotting, playing around with models, etc. And then, even within those languages, there are multiple libraries that people have used for modeling, and uh, we've included those too. And to give you an idea of why this might be useful, here's just the favorite sort of SIR model in a closed population. And then this is what the models look like in R and Python. And you don't have to be an expert in, in either of these to see that actually they're more or less the same sort of thing. But if you have these side by side and you wanted to turn it into an SEIR model, it would be quite straightforward to take one and then sort of re-implement it in a different language. Why might you want to use different languages yourself? Well, in many cases, if, even if the, um, the differences in syntax are quite minor, sometimes just simple things like performance can be a certain issue. Um, so, for example, uh, I've been working a lot in Julia. I've already mentioned this sort of very sort of multifunctional uh, package called differential equations. I've also got a sort of very fast Gillespie type um, simulation package. And then if you want to do something a bit more complicated, we also have a package to do piecewise deterministic Markov processes. So that would be if you've got like a stochastic forced SEIR model, or you're trying to do some hybrid system where you've got some large populations and small populations. And why you might want to do that? Well, let's just take a, a simple discrete time SAR model. This is just um, the fixed time step taking a binomial for the infections and the recovery. And it's just a sort of few lines of code. It doesn't take you very long to write. And in R, doing a thousand replicates takes seven and a half seconds. The Python code, which looks more or less the same, takes 1.8 seconds. And the Julia code looks kind of similar too, but it takes 0.03 seconds. So you don't have to run off and get a high performance computer. If you just sort of learn how to take even just your model and turn it into a different language, you can get some extra performance. We had a hackathon at the Alan Turing Institute. The idea there was to build up a collection of different models and to provide training and open it up to people, especially from low to middle income countries. And some people decided to bring their own model to try to put it into our platform. Others wanted to take things from textbooks and implement them. Others just did a literature search and try to find models that way. And sort of the ideas for this are in a sort of shopping list of models that allow us to sort of go through. We had 45 participants, 60% graduate students, 50% uh, female, and 10% uh, from low to middle income countries. So we had a nice diversity. We also had training sessions that were there too, that sort of were there to help springboard people trying to try new things. And we targeted a bunch of different sorts of models, ranging from deterministic, stochastic, age-structured, spatial, etc. And uh, let me just uh, show you what it looks like. So, so basically, we have a set of models, and it's just like a book. So, you know, we can go on to an SIR model. There's a little introduction. And then there are implementations in lots of things. Um, and those range from very simple things. You've got stochastic models, final size, host vector models, et cetera. And then, although I'm still working on it, um, there's, um, there are chapters that are virtually complete in terms of their R code from Otto Bjornstad's uh, book. And you see there's a little button here that says interact. When you click that, it opens up a new page, um, which is timed out right now. But basically, it gives you a notebook where you can actually go in and run the code and uh, play around with the parameter values yourself. You don't have to install anything. You just click a button. There's also other, um, there's greater pushes now towards visualization. And if you code your models in JavaScript, you get to enjoy a, quite a lot of tools for, um, for playing with that. So uh, here's a, a model that was made by Eric Voltz. It's basically based on uh, his and Joel's uh, work on models in configuration networks. And the nice thing about this, again, you don't have to install anything, 
but you can change things like the mean degree, et cetera, and it will go away and, and resolve things. So for teaching purposes, for didactic purposes, it's kind of useful as well. So how you can help is, well, if you've got a model, you've had a new paper, um, even if you don't want to do it yourself, please go on to this uh, shopping list and say, I've got this interesting model, it would be great if it was implemented. You can port an existing model, add your own, or just use this in terms of teaching and training. The, it's issued under a sort of permissive license that there's no, essentially, no copyright really. You just have to acknowledge uh, us when you do that. Uh, the next steps are to try to get more attribution involved. So at the moment, if you have an example, you're meant to put your name down on it and a date so that people can sort of find, and you can have URL links to you. But it would be nice for it to be able to be cited so that when you do the work, the recognition comes back to the individual, not to just the whole organization. It would be nice to have future hackathons. I really want to do an inference one. Trying to improve the platform. Uh, as well would be kind of useful. There are a number of ways the engineering could be improved because this really was, at least initially, just, just me working with this. So I'm no engineer. So um, unfortunately, making open models too easy not to do. It takes resources. And we, uh, uh, Rosego and I put in a grant to the Open Research Fund, and we got uh, all of two lines feedback, which was uh, that it's interesting and feasible. It's not clear how extensive the user base would be. Um, and the level of innovation proposed was considered limited. Okay. So that's, that's sort of arguable. Um, so to conclude, after adding a single hackathon, Epi Recipes already has a wide range of models, wider than most textbooks. Uh, in a variety of languages, and there's still lots to be done in terms of growing the community. So with that, um, you can try it for yourself. The main website, which everything links from, is uh, Epi Recipes, epirecip.es, which means I get lots and lots of emails from Spanish internet providers. And uh, we have the cookbook, <laughs> we have Observable, which are these JavaScript notebooks, and then all the code is available on the web for free. Uh, uh, because I, I don't like, you could just read it off as Epi Recipes, you see. It's just, it's just vanity. Uh, nothing else. So, uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions. Yeah, thanks for the for the great talk. I I have um, well, first of all, I'll just say that all our papers and short courses and long courses, full semester courses, and all on on GitHub. But I, I have one um, sort of frustration with the refereeing process, and I'm wondering if this is a service you could provide. So when you submit a paper, um, or when you review a paper, normally they say maybe that they'll put it up online when it's published but you don't get the code as a referee. And you can sort of see why people don't want to put their code public while it's not yet the final version and it's not published. But it would be really nice if in the paper you had a, a link to a currently secret but, but yet to be disclosed site. So basically it would become open on publication and, and the referees would have a link to the Epi Recipes version and then the, res the referees could see the current version of the code, the referees would be impressed, and you wouldn't have this problem that when the paper's finally accepted, isn't, you know, you're, you're off to the pub, you're not at that point <laughs> trying to um, clean up your code and put it online. I think that's an, that's an excellent point. Um, yeah, I think there is, at the stage where it, it should be you know, out there is when everyone's happy with both the text, you know, perhaps there's some fundamental flaw in the, the model that, um, you know, the referees might spot. So, I mean, that's, you know, straightforward to do. And in terms of how some of the online software journals are working is very much like that. You, you give people access to your repository and then they can make comments and so on. And then any changes just get merged into the thing. It's, um, as usual, it's just resources. And you know how do 
I or anybody else get sort of recognition as a, uh, a trusted, trusted source. I mean, given that I have you know, Microsoft in front of my name right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I take your point on board a lot. Um, I, I'm editor of, um, of some journals, and I've had some referees that essentially will refuse to make a decision until they actually get a copy of the data, but, or the model, or whatever. And um, they just won't budge. And you need to have all of the reports in. So it, uh, there is a sort of carrot and stick thing that you can do. And I haven't seen any cases where people have been scooped because they've given their code out. Uh, in the same way that I haven't seen a clone of your coursework appear in another institution just with uh, your name and Aaron's name just crossed out and you know, another one crayoned in. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think it would be great, but yeah. I mean, how would we exert pressure to be able to do that? So I would just agree with that as well, that I think as reviewers, we can also say that we're not prepared, you know, use, use that and say we're not prepared to review this until we have the code. And I think that's something that, that I do and that my colleagues do. And one thing I'd also know is what, what I tend to do is quietly release the repo at the time of review and then make a nice, you know, when it's done, make a nice clean one to put under our our departmental banner. Mm -hmm. So there are ways around it, but I agree that I think we should, if we can, use the pressure of, re of review to say we're, we're not going to do this until we can see the code. So I just wanted to make a comment. I've had some experience recently with, with publishing and releasing code, and I was also told submitting or basically referring papers for, for, for bioinformatics and BMC bioinformatics recently that they are experimenting with the new policy when all of the authors will have to provide code to referees specifically. That scares me because often that means that often I find myself in the sort of unfamiliar territory of having to judge whether the code kind of looks reasonably well. I mean, I can run it. But in terms of how well it is written, I really don't have the expertise and, and, and I'm a little apprehensive about having to make a, a judgment on that. The other thing, so, so that's one experience on the reviewer part, but the other was uh, Nature or some very, one of the Nature journals basically went, made us go through hell with this notion that we have to submit the, the clean code to the reviewers on the second revision. That meant that you know one of the postdocs spent basically three weeks of her life cleaning the code, and then at the end they decided, well, we actually don't like the paper that much. So, so thank you. Uh, so this was, you know, you, you kind of have to have policies that would be sort of global about these things because if you start developing these individually for the journals, they can be very, very confusing. So thanks, Simon. I thought that was a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, since there's this sort of proposal in the phylogenetics community that it might be possible, since we can never agree to use the same sort of software package, that we might be able to sort of write our models in a format that might be interpretable between different software packages. So we could pick something like uh, XML or JSON to a very expressive file format, which would allow us to basically code up the overall framework of our model in terms of the variables and parameters that we need. And then that model could be run in multiple different uh, languages or software packages. Um, do you think something like that would be possible for epidemiological models as well? I think part of the issue with that is that there's competition amongst the various ways to denote a model for uh, a computer to understand. So there's a nice package called VFGen that, you could, that uses an XML-based format to describe uh, differential equations and uh, delay differential equations. And the nice thing is that you, you write your model in the XML, and then it can automatically convert it into Python, R, C, Fortran, sort of you name it. Um, it hasn't really taken off. I mean, I think it's quite a good tool. But um, you know, there has to be, unlike in systems biology where there's more of a consensus about what that language should look like, for, for modeling and for on the computational side, it's, it's less of that. So I think it would be useful. But 
you still have to get to a certain critical mass where in order to be sort of published and popular or, or whatever, um, you use that sort of, uh, that sort of system. No, but, I'm, but it's more about just being able to reproduce it. Have they got the code that does what they say it does? So they're very, very, they're very basic. Do they have the code? And can you press a button and it will do what they say it does? It's not our job to be engineers or software developers or any of those sorts of things, but that's still a, an integral part of the paper. And at the very least, it should do what they say it does. And if anybody has a detailed question that has expertise in the area, they can look in the code. So like initial conditions, you don't necessarily have to read a computer language to say, oh, where are the initial conditions? What algorithm did they use to solve this uh, differential equation numerically? You know, are there any sort of oddities in there? Are they using some sort of weird aging model to, to look at an age structured model? There's all sorts of things that that are there that you would only get if the code gets out there. And I think you should lower the barrier to get that code out there. And for us, just saying, is the code there is probably good enough. The, the authors thought it was good enough to derive their results. Then surely it should be good enough to distribute. And it's not our role to, our role is to referee the science, not necessarily the implementation. I mean, I'm not an expert in formal methods. So, you know, in computer science, you, you, they address these sorts of issues. How do you know that a program is correct? And, and that's certainly outside of, of my expertise. My main issue is not necessarily when you have a, a model that has nice analytical results, but one where you have, say, a huge agent-based simulation that says, should we shut schools in some country to do this, where a perfectly well-meaning person could make an error in that, and those results hence be sort of open to interpretation. You know, it's not, it's not malice, it's not even negligence, it's something that still needs to be out there ultimately if we're gonna use these models for making decisions. Okay, uh, one comment related to that question though. Um, I've, even looking back at my own stuff from time to time, yeah, you know, I might read a paper and it may be, what exactly did I actually mean by that statement? And if I've got the code, uh, you know, there's no question what the actual implementation did. So like the, the start off with 40 initial infections, did they all start at the same time or did they get spread out? And there's a, you know, whether you're worried about whether the code is right or not, you can at least go back and look at what the actual assumptions are, which might not be clearly enough stated. Now, my question for you here uh, is, one of the fears I have, I've created this big software package. Um, I know that it, you know, it's built on Network X. Network X changes over time. The software I do changes over time. Somebody might write code that in one year's time, uh, it doesn't work on the up-to-date versions, and in 10 years' time, um, becomes unimplementable by anybody. Um, how do you solve that problem? So, uh, or someone solve it. So there's this um, handbook called The Turing Way from the Alan Turing Institute that's like a guide to be reproducible. And one of it is really about versioning. So the, uh, the things that run on the web uh, essentially are like a lightweight virtual machine that has all the dependencies fixed at certain versions so that you can go back and run something and it should run bit identical now as opposed to sort of 10, 20 years in the future, hoping that that underlying technology itself doesn't change. But that should change slower than Network X or anything. And if it's too much to ask somebody, when they write a program, they're not going to give the version numbers of the packages they used, and then the packages those packages use, and so on. It's just too much to sort of spit out. But if they do use a centralized platform, and they get it to work there, then at least there is 
uh, a version for the whole system together that should allow them to do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's computationally possible now, but we sort of, it, it requires engineering help and we often don't have that available to us. I think it's lunchtime now, it so is. can we thank Simon and all the